Good evening, folks. How's it going? Good. Welcome, Good Mr. Smith. Good. Hi. Hey, Principal Arduzer. How are you today? I'm well. How are you? Good. Thanks. And we are live on the YouTube. It's running now. We are waiting a few more minutes before we start to see if other participants join us. Welcome to the folks who are joining now. I see Jayla Harris and Ms. Harrison have joined. Welcome. We are ex hoping for a few more participants, so we're gonna wait just a couple more minutes to see if uh, other parents join in with us. And we may wanna go ahead and get started, Mr. Charbonnet, because in the email sent to the families, we stated that if they had questions, to come onto the Zoom, but to use the YouTube channel if they just wanted to be informed. That's an excellent point, Principal Arduzer. There may be countless uh, parents watching on the YouTube channel right now. <laughs> there may who, be. Who are here. So uh, to, to honor everyone's time, let's get started. So welcome everyone to our community input session, specifically for the families from the Archer <coughs> Community School. I'm Jeff Charbonnet. I'm the director of research at the school district office, and I'll serve as the facilitator tonight. And tonight is will be partly a presentation, but mainly our purpose is to get your input and questions and ideas about the proposed uh, process and form of the new school rezoning that'll be taking place as we come online with the new elementary school next fall and how that will affect other schools that are in the western part of Alachua County. So let me turn it over to the principal Stella Arduzer to welcome everyone. All right well good evening Archer families. Uh, we're really excited about getting more information about the uh, new school uh, currently referred to as Elementary School I. You've received countless e emails about this meeting. So hopefully many of you are attending on YouTube as well as this Zoom call. Uh, we are very familiar with Mr. Charbonnet and Ms. Neal who have been at our schools and helped us with uh, many of our strategic planning. Uh, we welcome Mr. Gilreath to our Archer family who, and he's also going to be helping the district with the rezoning of the new school. And before I turn it over to the district staff, I do wanna remind you that the YouTube channel is available for you if you'll refer back to your email. Uh, an email was just sent at six o'clock on the dot with that link. So please go ahead and press on that if you want to just tune in. Uh, also, if you have any questions, the, U the, Zo the Zoom is the perfect place to, to actually tap into. So you have the Zoom link if you have questions and you have some comments or would like to give input. And of course the YouTube link if you just wanna be informed and be a part of the process of learning. So once you have asked your questions and offered your thoughts, we will switch it, people in and out if we get too full. So, but right now it looks like we have plenty of space in our Zoom call. I'm glad that you all are with us tonight and I'm gonna go ahead and turn it back over to Mr. Charbonnet. Thank you, Principal Arduzer. And with us tonight joining us for the presentation is Ms. Kim Neal, who is our Director of Zoning and State Reporting. And Ms. Neal has many years experience as an elementary principal and has been involved in this rezoning plan and process uh, with her sleeves rolled up and digging into this very difficult uh, puzzle that needs to be put together from the very beginning. So we appreciate her expertise and being here tonight and she may join in and help uh, field some questions and provide some information as well in this process. Uh, also, we're expecting Mr. Reggie Thomas, who is our Director of Transportation, who may be joining us later as well as a district staff member uh, to, to provide some further answers and information uh, should any 
questions come up in the area of transportation. And just to give a little context, um, this new elementary school has been in the planning phase and is now in the construction phase and will be ready to come online and open next fall. So in anticipation of this, the school district has been looking at and developing possible uh, school attendance zones to um, have the students assigned to the school. And naturally when um, students are pulled from other schools, then there are dominoes that fall that affect other schools along the way, um, not just for the zoning of the students, which is our primary topic of conversation, but also the school will need to be staffed. And if students leave um, other schools, then um, teachers may leave those schools as well and go to the new school or follow students. So this will be a, a time of um, potential change across the district that could affect up to as many as nine schools that could be included in some of these plans. So. Uh, a big committee of district staff has worked to develop uh, various possible permutations of plans. These have been presented to the school board already in a workshop and gotten uh, input back from the board. It's also been presented to the district advisory council. And after that input and some community input, the committee even developed some additional plans that have now become part of the mix for things that are to be considered. So this is a very fluid process and we are very much open to your input and that of other members of the Alacho County community. And as a result of your excellent ideas and suggestions, additional plans could be developed or tweaks to some of these current plans before this finally goes to the school board. So we're in the process now of um, having these Zoom visits with the families of each of the schools that are impacted. Once that process is done, all of your input will be collected. I want to um, remind everyone or notify everyone that there is a dedicated uh, page on our school board website for this rezoning. And part of that page is an interactive map and we will post the link in the chat so that you can visit that page. And in that interactive map, you can explore each of the five proposals that are in play right now and even enter your own address and see where your home would fall in terms of any of these um, different zones. Also, there's a input form on that um, uh, on that website and we hope that all of you will do that because that's your formal mechanism for giving input. There's even a place for you to rate your satisfaction with the different plans that you're going to see tonight and that can all be um, tabulated and shared with the public and with the school board as a way of collecting the community input. So we hope that you will do that and encourage all of your friends and neighbors to give their input there as well. Then ultimately there will be um, another in-person opportunity for the community to come and give input. Then another school board workshop sharing all of the input and plans that have been developed. And then ultimately the school board will vote in a school board meeting for how it's going to proceed with this, um, this rezoning. And parents and community members will have an opportunity to address the school board through every step of the way in that process. So now I'd like to introduce our special guest, our consultant, Mr. John Gilreath, who has used all of this data and worked extensively to put together these various plans and worked with uh, the community, the school board, and the school board zoning committee. And he's going to share with you um, the main parts of the presentation that were also shared with the school board. So let's welcome and turn it over to Mr. Gilreath. Thank you, Jeff, for that excellent introduction. I appreciate it. I'm gonna get set up on our end for the presentation. And thank you all for being here tonight. Um, it is an honor and a pleasure on my end. Um, this is our third school that we've done. We had a public meeting uh, yesterday. 
and <clears throat> we are going through and showing everybody the options. Um, and I think what's important, you know, Jeff just mentioned it, but it's important to remember that this is the very beginning. Um, I said this to the board that this is a community mosaic. It's not anybody's individual portrait. Um, and that we are soliciting input from principals, parents, the board, and the general public. Um, and so that's what tonight is for. Um, we have a lot of slides to go through. Um, I recognize some of the names on here, so this may be the second or third time even that you've seen this, so bear with me. Um, but we'll go through a lot of these slides. I won't spend a ton of time on some of the districts that are not contiguous to Archer, but it is important to talk about how some of this data um, has been developed and, and where the data come, where, where, where it comes from. Um, and so we'll go through um, these slides, spending more time on some, less time on others, really with the goal of having enough time at the end for us to have a discussion, to hear your thoughts, take your comments in and bring them back to our committee. So a, a brief agenda for the presentation. We're gonna have an overview of school I. Um, we're going to talk about the capacity issues that are essentially throughout the district at the elementary level. We're going to talk about the planning considerations for elementary school I and what's gone into um, the initial options that have been, that will be presented to you tonight. Um, you will see those initial options and then we want to get to the main portion of tonight, which is the open discussion through our moderator, Mr. Charbonnet. So uh, quickly, you know, Elementary I uh, is located on 122nd, AKA Parker Road. Um, this can seat and is being constructed for up to 900 elementary school children, which is a large elementary school, um, but there's some reasons for that, um, for construction funding and student stations. Um, but we're not planning right now to fill up the school with 900 students right away. And we'll talk about some of those reasons coming up. Um, it's located in the Oakmont plan development. It's an 18 acre site that was granted to the school board as part of that development being approved by the county. It's located in unincorporated Alachua County. Um, it's located within the urban cluster that governs development um, within Alachua County. And this was a site that was selected by the school planning advisory committee um, that assembled between 2017 and 2018 with uh, members of the public, members of other external public agencies who went through and ranked available sites throughout the county for a new elementary school. Um, and this was ranked number one. Number two was actually purchased a few months ago. Um, an initial purchase was attempted a few years ago. Um, and number two was purchased a few months ago um, off of 143rd for a future site. So we talk about student locations and where students live throughout the district. This is, uh, you know, we're zooming in here on the urban area around Gainesville. Um, and this is a density map. And so we look a quarter mile from every other student to see where the highest proportion of students are. Um, and I wanna call your attention to sort of these, these red areas. These are what we call higher density areas of students. Um, these are subdivisions, large clusters of apartment complexes. Um, and you can see where they stand out along Archer Road. Um, south of Newberry Road along I-75, areas north of Newberry Road. Um, we do have some, some clusters of population density on the east side of the uh, city of Gainesville as well, um, but they really don't equate to the large densities west of I-75. Um, these students include public school students, charter school students, and homeschool students, but not private school students. You can see the location of I um, with the red map. So it's essentially at that far edge of the densest populations of students west of I-75. Um, but before you hit the more, you know, the rural areas as you head out to Newberry, um, southwest on Archer Road down to Archer. Um, one of the suggestions that we had early on from the board was to make sure we're providing a background on, on what the, the socioeconomic data um, in the district is. And so this is um, uh, American Community Survey Estimate data from 2016. Um, it's not official diennial census data. We won't have that till after the 2020 census has been compiled. Um, but this is, you know, averages that are compiled by the census throughout the decade between actual census counts. So these are the best 
estimates that we have, and and they are they're 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 not spot on, but they're they're good indicators of the socioeconomic levels throughout the county. And so um, we're, we're the, this map here is the percentage of the total population that's African American. Um, and you and and on the east side you can see a couple of block census block groups that are over 76 percent African American. Um, on the west side you don't see as heavy of a percentage, but you still see areas that are over 50 to 75, um, some areas that are 26 to 50. So, you know, one of the things is, is to dispel the, the myth that there is, there are not areas of diversity, um, and this is not just African Americans, but there are not areas of diversity west of I-75. There, there are. Um, right now, we're just showing you the African American, but that is available from the U.S. Census. This is data that we are using in addition to actual student data. And we'll talk about some of that as well. When we look at median income data, you can see school I is actually located in the highest median income um, areas in the county. Um, and you can see that there are a disparity of ranges west of I-75 as, as well as throughout the entire county um, in the school district. And this is an important one is, is where are our youngest where is the youngest percentage of the population living? And um, it's no surprise to anybody that, you know, development continues um, to occur on the western side of the county, on the western side of Gainesville. Um, and we see, you know, I, I won't make that correlation, but we do see a large percentage of, of the population that's under 18 west of I-75. And, and we use that to, to try to come out the college students um, and, 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 and negate the influence of that on this data. Um, and so what we're trying to see is where are we anticipating future populations? Um, so we use things like building permits, um, the, the uh, school district tracks development review. So we know where new developments are occurring and we use this data as well to know where our um, portions of the population are located. Sorry, I can't figure out how to get teams from popping up onto my workstation. So 2019 capacity, um, we're looking now at the enrollment versus the capacity of the school. So students who are attending and the capacity of the schools, you can see significant overcrowding, these areas of dark red. So you can see Archer in the Southwest corner at 113% over capacity in 2019. Um, there is not much breathing room throughout. There's really nowhere to put anybody in Newberry at 133% capacity. Um, you have Wiles at 127% and Idlewild that extends west of I-75 almost all the way into downtown Gainesville um, at 126% capacity. So these contiguous zones to Archer are, you know, over capacity as well as, you know, Archer being over capacity um, for elementary school. This is 2019 data. When we look at 2020, um, the news stays the same. Um, you know, in, in fact, in, in a lot of areas, it gets worse. This is a little bit of a different way to look at the data. Um, and this is looking at the schools in red are over 90% capacity. Now, that's the threshold for school choice. Um, and so that's a significant threshold to look at. And you can see the majority of schools in 2020 are over 90%. And when we look at 100%, really the only dropout is Williams um, on the eastern edge of Gainesville. You can see Williams drop out there if I go back and forth. William drops out when we put that 100% threshold. So, you know, the situation is critical throughout. Um, the new school is going in to address capacity. Um, when we think about the planning considerations that are coming up, you know, the policy, somebody yesterday in the, uh, in the, in the <clears throat> public meeting we had uh, brought up uh, the the list of um, considerations for planning, and, and this is this is how we've done this, um, and it's it's a board policy. Um, but I'll run through them right now. This is you know number one, we wanted to address capacity for elementary I and the surrounding schools, um, showing you the situation that you just saw. There are significant capacity issues that need to be addressed. We need to consider infrastructure, not just transportation, but um, utility infrastructure. We need to think about future land use. And we need to think about development and the rules that govern that development, but not only the rules that govern that development, but the development that's occurring. We need to think about diversity and not just from race, 
but from programmatic diversity. Um, we need to think about all the programs that we have in the school district, um, from ESE to the magnet schools, and we need to think about how that's going to be represented across each of these zones. The student body should be reflected the district, district's racial composition. Um, that is in the area of 42% white, 34% uh, African American. Um, and so we're trying to meet these goals as the district states in their equity policy. We also need to consider the sales tax initiative. We have four schools right now. Elementary school I is, under, is, is in significant phases of new construction. Um, Metcalf and Bishop Middle School are in phases of construction. Idlewild is nearing completion of design and starting to round the corner into construction. And so um, there are four schools right now that are having capacity or portables removed and renovation or construction is planned at every school. Um, and so, you know, there have been comments on, you know, why isn't this district wide? And, you know, that hasn't been the scope of this so far. And so we need to think about where those capacity enhancements are occurring um, if that route is going. But even if we don't go that route, we are needing to think about the capacity enhancements at these schools when they are occurring um, and when you could really put more students into a school. So while we want to make I representative of the student, you know, the, the district student body as a whole, we also want to avoid making all the contiguous or the neighborhood schools less representative. Um, Idlewild Elementary is coming up again because of the current construction there. Um, this, you know, some of the stated goals are to remove the portables at Meadowbrook, remove the portables at Idlewild, and the significant overcrowding going on in both of those areas where there is de significant development occurring within both of those zones. We have transportation concerns. That's not news to anybody who drives Archer Road west to east um, into town or Newbury Road west to east in the morning. Um, and we have some lessons learned from Meadowbrook. Um, it was a large zone that led to an immediate full capacity. We need to consider the student locations and the future development trends around school I more carefully. Um, Meadowbrook opened and two years later, there were portables at a new school. We want to avoid that. And I think that makes sense to everybody. Um, and so we're going to try to avoid that by looking at the areas around I, the zones around I, the development around I, and all of these other planning considerations. Um, walkability. Now, <clears throat> we've had the comment from people that, well, you're showing this as a walkable area. It's not. I live in a subdivision, you know, two miles from a school. I have to cross a major road. But what is important to be understood when I use the word walkability, you know, that could be interchangeable with required transport. So anybody over two miles, the district is required to transport. There's also a hazardous condition waiver where, um, and if Mr. Thomas is on, he could talk about uh, in the question and answer period. But this is where you can't have a waiver for hazardous walking conditions, but walkability as a whole is a two mile distance from a school. And so we need to think about that when we're drawing these zones. Um, this is based on road center line. It's not a hard buffer. And I'll talk about that coming up as well. You can see where I is located just west of the Wiles and Childs walkability zones. You can see that red star again. And just east of there, you see a large gap and you don't see any blue, yellow, or red. Essentially in that large gap, this is in between Newberry, um, 122nd Parker Road, Archer Road, and I-75. There are about 3,000 elementary school students for three schools. So that's a large challenge to figure out because if you put more than 1,000 in one school, you're not meeting the goal. Um, and so we can't, divide that easily. It takes a lot of time and effort looking at how we're going to put these zones in. Um, and one of the things to think about is that these students are eligible for transportation. Um, and so they can't walk to any school, even if um, even if they were closer, right? There's still some large, large streets there, large, large roads. Um, and the dense population there, 3,000 students in that area, has required some thought into how we put these zones together. 
I'm not going to spend a lot of time on um, these other zones. I know we want to talk about Archer, but I think it's important to look at some of the some of the issues that are um, plaguing these zones. So Meadowbrook, I've talked about Meadowbrook, and that is a large zone extending south of Newberry, east of I-75, all the way over almost to 43rd Street. Um, in 2019, you had over 820 children attending a school of 722 permanent capacity. Looking at that, that data a little bit more, you know, over 700 of those students live over two miles from Meadowbrook. So, um, you know, there aren't a lot of students that live within walking distance of Meadowbrook with the exception of the ones you can see right there um, with the school location in the square in the dead center of the map. Again, large zone, disparate um, population centers. There's a lot of development occurring in the town of Tioga um, along Newberry Road. And something to take away from this is that there are 936 students potentially zoned for Meadowbrook. So if everybody who was zoned for Meadowbrook attended Meadowbrook, you'd have 936 students in a, in a school a capacity of 722. This just froze on me. Okay, here we go. So when we think about Idlewild, Idlewild is another um, planning consideration for elementary I. It's in the same boat with a, the uh, majority of their students living further than two miles from the school. A permanent capacity of 557. Now Idlewild has fluctuated in attendance, sometimes higher than 800. Um, sometimes a little bit lower than 700, but you know, they're right around 700 plus attending in 2019. But with Idlewild, if everybody zoned for Idlewild attended Idlewild, you have 1,100 children attending there. Um, and so, you know, this is a concern for the school district, especially with a school that with capacity enhancements will be around 600. Um, and so, again, we had some planning considerations. And number one, remove students from Meadowbrook remove students from Idlewild, deal with capacity in these surrounding schools. Hidden Oak I like to bring up because you can see sort of that donut, a uh, lack of red just south of the Hidden Oak blue square. Um, this really shows you the true center line distances. So this isn't a hard buffer, a two mile perfect circle. We're using the road center line distances and there's homes just south of Hidden Oak can look over their fence and see Hidden Oak, but if they're gonna walk along the street and the sidewalk, it takes longer than two miles to get there. Conversely, you can see a little bit of a bleed out east of I-75 of walkability along 23rd Avenue. So there are just some things that when you look at the data this way, start to stand out that are that, that dispel some conceptions about walkability in an area. Terwilliger is another one to think about because there are 400 students being transported to Terwilliger up Tower Road, over Newberry, and then down to Terwilliger. And, um, that is a zone that's split by I-75. There aren't a lot of students that live in and around Terwilliger. The majority are transported to Terwilliger. <clears throat> so rezoning effort to date, and, uh, and Jeff talked about this early on, you know, we're building upon a half decade, a decade of the school district's planning data. So student locations, capacity, um, facility maintenance projects and construction projects. Um, we're building a lot on the work that had been done by the school planning advisory committee, looking at these um, scenarios for where students live and the best best sites for a new school. We had the facilities half cent um, initiative that was approved by voters in 2018. And then the, the project schedule was approved by the board in April of 2019. And we've started board review and input from the public on the rezoning effort now. And so um, you know, Jeff mentioned the, the board has seen this and provided some comment. We've had some input from the district advisory committee. We have met with Newberry, um, Idlewild, and we had a six hour public meeting yesterday. And so this is where we are right now. And again, I, I really have to stress to everybody before we start talking about the options, the fact that this is the beginning point. We're here tonight to hear your input. We want to know what you like, what you don't like, what you support, what you don't support. Um, we need input from you to make this the best product possible. Now, is everybody's input going to make it into the final iteration? We cannot guarantee that, but we can guarantee we are going to listen. 
We are going to take notes and we're going to bring this back to the committee for detailed discussions about everything we talk about tonight. And we're going to do that for every one of these meetings that we have because we know it's important. We know it's going to make the best product possible. And at the end of the day, we need to listen to you, the parents and the public to make sure we're doing that. So I want to show you just the current zones. Now, this PowerPoint, I, like I said, I'd be moving through these. This is available online. So if you want to go back and see these while I'm talking or refer to things, you, you can do that um, during the Q&A period. We can come back and refer to slides as well. Um, but the, the current Archer zone you know, extends all the way up to Newberry Road, south of Archer, over past Wakahuda, and then up Archer Road, including meadows on the prairie subdivision. This is a large zone, and this is a rural zone um, for the most part. And so there's lots of stretches of non-residential land. We'll just call it that. Um, it's different than some of the other zones. Each of these zones have their own considerations. I wanna give you some of the, the current elementary school zone context around I. So Archer is down on the Southwest corner, not labeled. I, I'm showing you this because again, I told you between 122nd where I is located, Newberry Road on the North end of this image, I-75 cutting down diagonally and Archer Road cutting down diagonally. There are 3000 students in that area for essentially three schools. Um, there's a significant population north of Newberry Road that attends Hidden Oak. Um, I've talked a little bit about the Terwilliger population, but just in this area, there are about 3,000 students. There are also some significant areas of density and development that are occurring or have occurred. Um, and so just, you know, southwest of that red circle at the bottom, you have Lugano that is going in now. Um, we are aware of that. We track development throughout the district as part of concurrency. Um, and there's a report that's issued every year through an interlocal staff working group with um, planning representatives from public agencies throughout the county. Uh, and these are identified. And if you go on the county growth management site, you can see where development petitions are occurring. And, and predominantly right now, they're occurring up there in that northwest corner of this image around Newbury Road, Town of Tioga. West End Golf Course for sale. There are a lot of development permits going in. I'm not saying they're not happening anywhere else, but that is our densest concentration right now. Um, we also have 30 years of building permit data from the county that we've been looking at, and you can watch that development march west year by year by year. So going into option A. Option A is the first option that we presented to the board. Um, it removes 132 students from Archer. You can see it um, southwest taking in Lugano, Meadows on the Prairie, um, Longleaf, Mentone. And this is in an effort to address the development that's occurring in the area I just talked about um, in town of Tioga up along Newberry Road, these areas to try to capture some of that development that would be going into these other schools, overcrowding them. It also takes in a significant number of children from Childs, Meadowbrook, but it really doesn't meet the stated goal of Meadowbrook, which is about 150 students to remove the portables. This does remove 269 students from Wiles. I have the breakdown of potential demographics. And I wanna make very clear as we start talking about demographics that it's important to understand these are all the students in the potential zone. So I'm gonna show you demographics for the students who could potentially be zoned there and that's showing their demographics now. That's not saying they'll all go there. I'm also gonna show you the current demographics. And when you see those, and I'll remind you this again, that's not the current school attendance, that is the current demographics of the entire zone. That's an important distinction, but I just want to tell you that up front. This option doesn't meet a couple of the planning considerations. Number one, it doesn't meet the board's equity policy. Um, that is a skewed, um, uh, uh, 60 almost 60% white doesn't meet that equity goal of the district. It also doesn't remove any students from Idlewild. Um, and doesn't really affect much of the Idlewild zone. It removes some, not many. And so we need to consider that as part of this option. 
Um, and these are the important considerations. So it does some of the things we want, not all, it addresses that development on the northern end, but it doesn't really take care of the problem at Idlewild. Option B. Option B brings it down uh, a little bit further north. So Meadowbrook's district stays the same as it was before. Still has Town of Tioga and Meadowbrook. It doesn't really address that development now, but it runs along Archer, addresses the development in Finley Woods, and also takes in 216 children from Idlewild. And that's important to note because around Celebration Point, you have an apartment complex just west of there, about 140 children. Um, who are now going to Idlewild. And, and you can see that district for Idlewild um, just southeast of that light blue line in that colored area around Williston Road and Archer Road. You know, that would all come over into Wiles right now. And so that takes in um, Longleaf, Mentone, Meadows on the Prairie, Logano, Celebration Point, and Finley Woods. Option C, does not remove as many children from Archer. It's about 20 children. Um, it also sort of, in, in, in a lot of ways, reverts back in that Logano area back to the original zone. And so um, if you're in Meadows on the Prairie, this is where you would stay in Archer in this iteration. Now, I want to note here that 802 students were located in I in 2019, potential students. In 2020, you can see the growth occurring already, 863. Um, this removes over 300 students from Idlewild and removes over 350 students from Meadowbrook to make room for that development up along Newberry. Let's look specifically at Archer. So you can get a better look at Archer here. Um, I do want to note on the western edge, we've taken in a portion of Newberry. There aren't a lot of students there, but we have taken in a portion of Newberry there. Um, and there's some small iterations, um, or not small changes, I should say, not iterations, small changes um, on that zone that's sort of south of elementary I. Um, that changes in option E um, as well. And so Again, looking at this, this actually brings you down 20 students. You're, you're within the area of the stated goal for the equity policy. Um, and overall, this meets a lot of the planning considerations. Um, but this does have effect on subdivisions that are currently attending Archer would stay in Archer. You can see the chart. I won't spend a lot of time on these other ones. If we want to go back and look at them, we can. Again, this is available online. Um, as well as in some other formats that we'll tell you about. This is Hidden Oak, um, would go up in, in, in zone students. <clears throat> the Idle Wild Zone, which has some direct play there with Archer on the southwest side. So you can see that some of this stays the same there for Idle Wild, some of it changes. Predominantly, the changes from Idle Wild are taken into Wilds in this, in this iteration. What's, what's interesting to note about this is that even with 400, you know, almost 400, 300, over 300 students being taken from Idlewild, the demographics don't change that much. And that's, that's just as an inter interesting note. When you remove that many children, then the demographics don't change. John, I'm going to interrupt for one second. You have a black box showing on the screen still. I'm sorry. That is my Zoom that keeps popping up there. Is that better? <laughs> now it's gone. I'm sorry. You interrupt me whenever you want, Miss Neal. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. I'm not paying attention to that screen. I'm looking into the camera, so I'm not doing this. So I'm sorry about that. How long has that been up there? Whole time? A while. <laughs> you need me to go back? I think we're okay. I think you were able to explain everything through. I just know okay, that. Great. Thank you. I apologize. I did that yesterday, too. It's okay. Thank you. I'll try to stop doing that. Um, <laughs> I'll remind you earlier next time. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> option C, um, I think what's important to know about option C here, and I, and I do want to talk about it, is Meadowbrook stops at I-75. And you can see a dramatic reduction in the student population to make way for some of that development. Uh, we've had a, a number of comments um, at the public meeting yesterday from parents. Um, and so this is an option that has been put out that has, that has probably caused the most comments so far. 
Newberry, there is a little area there um, along 170th that comes, you know, is taken out of Newberry that goes into Archer. Um, and that is to deal with, with the significant overcrowding at Newberry as well. I mean, they're 133% over um, and over capacity. And so, you know, there's some of this in this, in this option, some of the students go to Meadowbrook um, and some are taken down to Archer. Terwilliger changes dramatically as well. Um, it no longer crosses I-75 and now runs north up of 39th, taking in a, a majority of Meadowbrook. We've had a lot of comments on this as well. This essentially changes the entire population of the Terwilliger Elementary. Um, and that's important to note in this option. And Wiles, um, Wiles is important as well because it's down there, you know, looking at Longleaf, some of these other areas on, on Southwest Archer Road um, that, that border um, the Archer boundary in, in some of these options. And so in this option, you know, Wiles, currently has over a thousand students zoned for Wiles. Um, they're eating lunch at 9.30 in the morning. And this proposed option would bring that down to about 865 students zoned. Now it's not perfect. You can see on the Western edge of the Wiles that that is the street that Wiles is located on. There are homes across the street that would not go to Wiles. Um, and so these are the things that we do want to comment on. We acknowledge that everything we're doing is our best recommendation, and now it's time for us as a team to shape it together. Um, this is not the end all option and not every option is perfect for everybody. And so we are interested in this comment. So we have comparisons of um, the demographics for each school. Again, this is important to note, these are potential zones. The numbers may be hard for you to read, but I do want you to pay attention to the colors. We made it easy for the people in the back. Um, and so to note on this, Archer's demographics stay essentially the same in this option. Childs change significantly. Terwilliger changes significantly. Um, Hidden Oak has some changes. Meadowbrook changes um, and becomes in a 64% white versus 57% white. And so we're looking at these changes to try to make sure that these options don't provide something totally skewed in the 70, 80, 90% range um, unintentionally. And so we're looking at these. We've run through other, op you know, other options that we're gonna show you coming up um, that don't have significant changes to many of these. So let me talk about that. Option D, everything stays the same in option D except for that Meadowbrook zone. A portion of it now extends east of 39th Avenue. You can see that uh, with a close up of the zone. You can see that it bumps up that um, proposed zone now back from, I think it was like 540 but 750. Um, and it addresses some of the diversity that we saw in option C at Meadowbrook. And Terwilliger just reflects that um, area east of Santa Fe that has been drawn back into Meadowbrook in that option. Another view of the summary for that option. And now option E. So option E has 840 students located in I. It removes over 300 from Idlewild, but removes less than 100 from Meadowbrook. So we're not meeting um, that goal in Meadowbrook, um, but we are meeting the goal in Idlewild. Um, Archer. So in this option for Archer, there's a small change around Lugano. You can compare these at your, at your leisure. Small change. Um, and then on the southeastern side, skirts a little bit north of Misty Oaks and, and County Road 346A. Um, and so you can see that with many, almost you know, every one of these options, the population at Archer does not change significantly, either increase or decrease. Um, the zone of Archer really centers around that area on Archer Road. Um, the changes are 
taking place there. I've talked about the bulb out from Newberry, um, but, but I, I, I imagine that this is going to be most of the discussion tonight. I could be wrong, um, but that is really what I've been focusing on through this presentation is that area. And that's really where if you look through the different options, you can see the changes. Childs um, comes in a lot to the west. Wiles takes in a little bit more and moves off of that road that I told you wasn't ideal before. This brings Childs up over 100 children. So no option is ideal. Remember I said there's 3,000 students in this area. Um, it's really hard to fit them all into a nice, neat zone because of the transportation infrastructure, because of the population density, because of the location of the schools. Finally, elementary eye, you can see comes down, stops um, north of Archer Road, extends north to take in the heavy development that's occurring up there. Um, a proposed zone of about 840 students. And you can see this uh, is almost spot on with the equity um, goals of the district. Hidden Oak, I won't spend too much time on Hidden Oak. Idlewild, again, you can see that change there south of Archer Road where Finley Woods comes into Wiles. Um, and portions of the, I believe it's the farm on Meadows, the development just east of Meadows on the Prairie. I could, I could be getting that totally wrong. I apologize. I don't have all the subdivisions committed to memory. Um, that is the current zone now. That doesn't change much. What does change in option E is the introduction of Littlewood. Um, and that is to relieve additional um, population from Littlewood where south of 20th Avenue would start going into Terwilliger. Um, this also drops the population of Littlewood down in anticipation for their major um, redevelopment that's coming up where Littlewood is gonna be taken and put across the street in the transition school currently where Bishop students are held on the Westwood campus. And another view of Meadowbrook, um, really extending back to you know portions of its original zone, um, going back up to a proposed zone of around 850 students, which is well over capacity. Um, and so option E doesn't address what's going on in Meadowbrook for um, the goal of removing the portables, the goal of giving them their physical education field back. And again, another look at Newberry, um, similar to option um, C and D with the ball light on the south going to Archer. Um, and what's notable there is that the area east now goes back into Newberry, not into Meadowbrook up there north of Newberry Road. Terwilliger, again, you can see where it's taken in that southern portion of Littlewood um, down by Butler Plaza um, south of Wind Meadows Boulevard. And finally, Wiles, um, where we're able to get Wiles down below their current zone of 1050 or um, 1,050 students to a proposed zone of around 930. Um, is that ideal? No, it's better. And so I'm interested to hear comment on this because I showed you two earlier comparisons of pie charts. Um, and I have gotten comments back saying pie charts are hard to read. Um, can you please give this to us in a table format? And so I have the table format as well. Um, when we come back, possibly for the final big board workshop, we may have completely one or the other. But I'm interested to hear the public comments on what's easier for you to make the comparisons, what's easier for you to read, because we're shaping this as we go through. Um, you're, everybody's getting the same presentation, but we are taking in comments um, as we're going through this process. So we're here at the end. Um, next steps. Well, we've gotten some initial input from the school board members. Ultimately, this is going to be a school board decision. The board members will have to vote on recommendations that are brought forward from staff. Those recommendations will be shaped by input from the board members, from workshops, input from the district advisory council from committee meetings feedback from affected school principals. Um, letters have been sent out to um, the affected school, parents at the affected schools. We have these virtual public meetings for input. 
Um, and something that is important to note is that, you know, this current district-wide construction initiative is adding capacity for a number of schools. This may result in a comprehensive rezoning across the district, considering not just elementary, but middle and high schools. Um, and that's something to consider this, and that's something the board's going to have to consider as well. Um, comments we've gotten back, well, we need to, uh, initially we realized very quickly that we need to have a central repository for public comment as we started all getting e individual emails in. Um, and we have created the website rezoning at gm.sbac.edu for you to send your comment in. We've also created a web map. Let me show you that. Um, if you go to the school board site, you can get to a rezoning map that shows you current zones. You can turn on aerials if you'd like, or you can go to something like open street map for a little bit more reference. <clears throat> you can see the current zones here. You can click in the zone and get the zone if you're zoomed in. But we also have the different options. And so we put option A in just as an overlay on the current zones to see so you can see the impact on the other zones. You can see option B overlaying on the current zones. You can turn the current zones off and start looking at option C. Option D. And option E. If you enter in your full address. It'll zoom in. If it's not an official address, it may take you to a street center line, but you'll still be, excuse me, in the area that you want to go. Additionally, all of these presentations and meetings have been put up on the school board's website for viewing. And we have created a Google input form um, available on the school on the school's website for you to, to enter in your information to uh, and provide input to school board staff on these options. With that, I'm gonna stop, open it up for the most important part of tonight, and that's to hear what you have to say. Um, Jeff, if you have anything to add. Um, Ken, uh, Mr. Gilreath, while you have that screen up, could you share your screen one more time and maybe just go back one to bring up the elementary school I rezoning site? Do you um, want the shared map? Um, well, from from the map, if you can go back to the, the overall rezoning site, is it just? Oh, not? yes. Yep. Here we go. Sorry. Yes. There you go. And then from I'm here, sorry. um, on the right hand side, we start here, right? Revitalizing. No, there's a, a, if you come to the main school board website now on the landing page, there's a crawl across the top and there's a link right there. Yeah, see where it says COVID-19, Alachua Digital Academy, et cetera. Just let that continue to scroll across your screen and the elementary school rezoning will come up and you can click there and it'll take you into the rezoning oh, site. That's great. Um, the left-hand side with this text here also has links to go back and watch the school board workshop um, to view other presentations that have been uh, on the YouTube channel. And then on the right hand side, that box at the top that says zoning options, that first one is the link to the web map that uh, John was just showing you. So click there, it takes you into the web map. Okay, and then the... Do we have an address? I don't know one off the top of my head. <clears throat> you can put in your full address sure. um, and it will drop down. It'll take you to where you want to go. Here, and John, go to back to the, to the zoning site again. Let me go to here. Oh, there. And then uh, in that zoning options box, again, on the right uh, under the zone, the next is a, the uh, citizen input form. Exactly. So, this is where we hope that everyone will complete this form. This is a way that you can formally provide input to the school board, um, give some information about yourself, but then express your opinions about each of these options 
as you see them on the map. And then toward the bottom, a place for your comments and questions. And if you give your input here, then it can be tabulated and compiled and be officially shared with the school board. So we're relying on uh, the citizens of the community to give this input so that we can get a sense of uh, how you feel and what's important to you. And we've gotten some great comments already, constructive comments that have let us go back and look at specific areas. Um, think about how we're looking at other data sets. And um, I, I, it's been very valuable to have this input so far. Well, our goal is to create the best plan possible. We know that uh, it may not be a plan that it takes in everyone's considerations or, or pleases everyone, but we certainly want to try to make the best plan uh, for the children of our school district. So I'll stop sharing with that, Jeff. If I have to bring it back up, I have no problem doing that, okay. but I will turn it back over to you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see a few more people have joined us on the Zoom call, and I know there are many folks out there on YouTube as well. Uh, Mr. Thomas, our transportation director, has also joined us now, so um, he'll be available to answer any specific questions. Um, transportation questions. So at this point, since it's a, a fairly small number on the Zoom call, if there are any of you that would like to make a comment or ask a question, just go ahead and uh, unmute and you can have the floor. Hey folks. Hi, Mr. Smith. Um, so I have a couple of questions. I just want to do this one first, though. Um, do we have a hard number or some sort of idea of uh, the per pupil cost for transportation in the district? So this, I guess, just an average cost of how much it costs to um, transport a child. Does Distance is irrelevant, I guess. I'm just trying to figure out how much we're spending and how many students are transported, I suppose. Well, I, I could not even begin to hazard a guess on that one, but we have Mr. Thomas, our Director of Transportation, who might be able to give us a better sense of, of that. Mr. Thomas, any feel for the per pupil transportation cost? So that, so that cost fluctuates from year to year. First of all, a good afternoon every, or evening, everyone. So that cost fluctuates from year to year uh, based on our FTE. Last year, we transported about 9,000 students um, for transportation. And the state typically pays us um, per child for regular riders. Um, and, it, and it goes anywhere from between 320 uh, to 450. It would depend on um, the state's average, so it's it's an average that's calculated. Um, the, uh, so that's where we calculate. Mr. Thomas, we're losing you. We're only getting every other word. Um, I'm sorry. Yep, you're breaking up, Mr. Thomas. No. no. So, uh, Mr. Smith, do you want to yeah. go on to your second question and maybe Mr. Thomas? Okay. Um, well, all of them are transportation related, I guess, really. Um, I guess the gist of it is what I'm getting at is. Um, we live in the Hammock Ridge neighborhood, and it's probably, I want to say, almost nine or almost 10 miles to get to Archer Elementary School every day. And I know uh, specifically, I think it was yesterday, that the school bus didn't show up in our neighborhood and parents were forced to drive their children to school. You know, and a lot of people live... Um, or, or work the opposite direction. So we're, 
driving kids to school because the bus didn't show up and it's already a harried situation. Now we've got to, you know, get in the car or there were, there was a parent that share a vehicle and that's nearly impossible to, you know, you're going to be late for school and work in that situation. Cause if you work back at UF, for instance, I mean, that's, that's a good uh, 15 to 20 miles from Archer Elementary. So, you know, I was wondering, I guess what I'm wondering is in the modeling, is there another school district that's going to be affected or zone that's going to be affected um, that has to go that far? Is this a special unique situation for Hammock Ridge? I guess that's what I'm getting at. And I think um, probably John, you could probably figure that out at some point, I think, eh? Can you hear you me? I'm sorry. Unmute. You have to unmute, John. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry. That was that was a uh, that's a great question. I'm gonna look into that for you. How about that? That's a great question. Um, yeah, I think that's not, right now, and I think it's important to note that when we go in and do a transportation modeling, that's a very involved model. Oh yeah. <laughs> and so at this point right while we're taking input lines can change um we have not given gone down to the to the full depths of a model now we're looking at it we're just like we're looking at achievement we've talked about achievement previously um so that is an excellent question i don't have an answer to that right now i'll be honest with you i can't pull that off the top of my head and to yeah. do it right now and look at it would be a disservice to your question sure so that's something we're going to look at for sure um i can tell you that we are looking at um an area that's similar um that goes seven miles to newberry right now um and so you know that that is something that we're thinking about and we have, I mean, you, you've you been an ardent commenter since the beginning, and we appreciate that. Um, and so, you know, that area is not lost on us. We are looking at that area, and that's yeah. something else that we need to look at. So thank you for that. Yeah, I'm not trying to bug you. Hey, John. You are not bugging me. No, you're great. I love it. You want a job? I think Mr. Thomas's connection might have improved here, and I can tell he's trying to come back into the conversation. So I, I can say that, uh, I, you know, I live out in the country, so, you know, my Internet is not as good as most of you all's. But but to your question as to um, buses and, and that those kinds of things, the state determines what the average cost for students is. And it could range for our regular ed children anywhere between 300 and 450 per child. And for our special needs, it could be anywhere between um, 900 and 1200. It, it differs every, uh, every year based on state funding. Um, and so the calculation is done for the, for the entire state. And then that money is divvied up based on ridership. So last year we transported 9,000 students. Um, so, so the state will take that and average it statewide with other districts. And then no, those fundings will be decided based on student cost. What we have tried to do this year to try to help parents because I understand the concerns of parents with late buses and, and of course trying to make sure that they get their child to the bus on time. So each night, as an example, if you go on our website tonight, it will tell you tomorrow what buses that we're anticipating to be late and how late those buses might be um, because of one reason or another um, buses, because we have a 38 student limit. And so that's what we've tried to do to help parents kind of solve that problem about if I leave my child at this stop, is the bus coming? Um, and so that's what we tried to do um, to help parents understanding that we all have to go to work. All right. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. You're welcome. And I hope that helps that gentleman's question. Does anyone else have a question or comment? Go ahead and unmute 
and you have the floor. I just thank you, Mr. Thomas. I appreciate your input. You're welcome, sir. Thank you. If there is anyone watching on the YouTube channel that has a comment or question and would like to come over and hop on the Zoom, we have room for you and would welcome you. You were so thorough, Mr. Gilreath, that we are at a loss of, for words. Uh, <laughs> I love what I do. I really do. Well, as we're waiting for any further questions or input, I just went over to the shelf and grabbed my master's thesis that I wrote many, many, many years ago when I was a student at the University of Florida. And I was just reminded by these questions about transportation in this fascinating work of research called the public school system in Alachua County, Florida from 1821 to 1955. So one of the things you aren't that dating uh, yourself when you graduated, then are you? <laughs> <laughs> I want to read that, uh, Jeff. I want to read that. Alachua County, being a, a typical North Florida county, back at the turn of the last century and throughout the early 1900s, was a very rural county and population, a small population, quite spread out and no modern road system. So there were well over a hundred public schools in Alachua County uh, in 1900. Um, remember that there was very strict segregation in those days. So there were separate white schools and black schools and that these were mostly small one room schools scattered across rural areas where there were small settlements that people, children would walk to school and all of the children of uh, the same, of multiple grades would be in the same school. They'd have very short school terms. Sometimes a school term would only last three or four months. Um, the school teachers would sometimes live in Gainesville and ride the train out to a community like Archer and get off the train and, and walk through the woods to a settlement to a small one room school. But as the county began to modernize through the 1910s and 20s and 30s, these smaller schools began to be consolidated where it was more efficient to have larger schools with more teachers, could separate the students into grades, and you could offer longer school terms by having more consolidated schools. But then that meant that the students had to be transported to the schools. So as roads began to develop, there was no county owned transportation system. The county didn't own its own fleet of school buses. So it was contracted. So people who owned flatbed trucks could contract to run them as school buses and the county owned the bus bodies that they would mount on the truck chassis. So the truck drivers would come in with their trucks and a crane would lift the bus body onto the back of the truck and it would be bolted down. They would run and pick up students and take them to school, then take the, uh, the bus body off and then they would go and haul lumber or watermelons or all kinds of products during the day and then come back and pick up the kids in the afternoon. And the old timers uh, that I talked to in doing my research talked about riding school buses where there was all kinds of farm products and sawdust and things still on the floor of the bus because it was just somebody's working truck that was being converted into a, a school bus. So. Of course, we've come a long way from those days um, and now have a, a modern efficient fleet of GPS enabled school buses um, all over the county 
that Mr. Thomas gets to, to head up for you. So, so that's our moment in history. That was great. Thank you. We do one of those for every meeting now. We get a little bit of a, <laughs> that was great. Thank you. All right. You're welcome. Just for everybody's benefit, Mr. Charbonnet has been working for the district for, I don't want to date you. 36 years. 36 years. He was my principal at Eastside High School when I was learning how to be an effective teacher. He groomed me and he's the reason why I'm a principal. So I blame him. Oh, I, think, <laughs> I think I learned more about literacy instruction from you than you ever learned from me, Ms. Arduza. So anyone who has a comment or question, please unmute and jump into the conversation. So Mr. Charbonnet, let me give you some data for 2020. In North Carolina, they are still building school buses the same way. They're taking the chassis and placing them on the bus. And, and they do that for a specific reason, so that if a bus is in an accident, the bus is actually on impact to come off the chassis for the students' safety. So they are still building them the same way they built them back in the day that you did your thesis. How about that? That's, well, if it, if it works, don't change it. Well, I think if no one has further comments or questions, we may just uh, convene our meeting early. So let's put out a last call. If anyone would like to contribute with a question or comment, please unmute and do so now. Before we go, it may be good to outline the um, first reading, second reading dates. Well, let's see if that is, uh, I was going to see if that was up on the website. I know someone who's spot on with it, who's ready. <laughs> I can definitely help fill that in if you would like. Okay, uh, take it away, Miss Neal. No problem. Our school-based meetings are scheduled um, throughout the next several weeks with our last school-based meeting being on November the 12th. From there, our committee will be um, looking at all of the feedback. So the um, zoning Google form, that, that feedback form that was shown a little bit ago, we're gonna put a deadline for that to have all input on by Monday, November 15th. I think that's the date, or 16th, November 16th. Um, so that we can get all of that information gathered look to see if we need to do any other tweaking before our next official board workshop on December 1st. I forgot to say there is also an in-person meeting that is going to be held on November 4th. That will be um, beginning at about four o'clock in the afternoon until eight is the window of time that will be at the district office available in the boardroom. We will have um, some question answer time there as well. So if you would like to speak with us individually or as the group in person, that will be an option available on November 4th. Then I'll skip ahead. December 1st is our next big board workshop where we will have all of the board members there. Um, time for us to reshare any of the plans with the board as well as take public comment. Um, and then our first reading of the policy um, which would be pres the formal presentation will be, I believe it is December the 15th. And at that time, that is where our board will decide on which plan they would like to continue to move forward with. Then the final decision as to if that plan is approved, if there are other tweaks to that plan, and the final decision timeline would be for the board to have that decision on the February 2nd board, board meeting. So there would be times for public comment between those meetings from December to February. So by February 2nd or on February 2nd, hopefully we will know what that final plan will look like. 
Thank you, Ms. Neal. You're welcome. Mr. Smith, I see you unmuted. <laughs> um, hi, Ms. Neal. Um, so on February 2nd, it, will that be the seating of the new, will the new board members be seated at that, at that time? They yes. will be. The new board members, um, the new board will be in place the middle of November. So that's part okay. of where the first um, next big public workshop will be after the new board is okay. seated. Okay. So Fair that enough. we didn't want to start the, the reading of policies and then have a board change and then continue on. So to be fair to the board, the new board coming on, we wanted to make sure that it was a continuation or a, not a continuation, a continuous process from the new board forward. Right. Okay. I, I was unaware that they were going to change that soon. I figured it would be in January with the rest of everybody else in the world, I guess. But Right. Yeah. No, our, it will happen uh, mid-November. 10-4. Okay. Good question. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. You've been so, so helpful. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Matt, thank you for your attention. Max says hi, Miss Arduzer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we'll see you all next time. Ms. Arduzer, do you want to take us out here with a good night to the Archer community? Absolutely. On behalf of our Archer community, we want to thank you um, and Ms. Neal and Mr. Gilreath for finding it uh, important to inform us. Uh, so please understand that it might be low attendance right now through our Zoom, but the YouTube, it being recorded is very helpful for people to, to go back and really digest this. But the importance of informing us and educating us is really uh, taken into account. And we, we can't thank you enough. And, and thank Mr. you Thomas, all. Thomas, we appreciate him also. Oh, Mr. Thomas, yes, I'm so sorry, Mr. Thomas. Yes, you too. And I know transportation is a beast, uh, but we are working, we're working alongside you here at, and I'm looking down at his box, working alongside <laughs> you here at Archer as well. So we support you and your team and love our bus drivers. So thank you all so much for attending. And as always, go Eagles. Thank you and good